Heavenly Father, we read in your word that all men are like grass, and their glory is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord stands forever. May your forever word be our teacher today. In Jesus' name, amen. Called the message today, and rightly so, the triumphant entry. It was a wonderful moment that so many of us were able to see when, Tim, when uh, Emirates Team New Zealand won the America's Cup again. Uh, it was lovely to see that 8,000 boats of various sizes ushered our winning team back uh, to their home base. And there at the home base, there were thousands and thousands of people uh, awaiting them, um, lining the docks, lining that whole area. I'd never seen as many people down on the viaduct. And when our team landed at their berth, they, they, the crowd opened up this very narrow uh, Parade of honor, as it were, and our team made their way through the crowd to the podium to receive the cup. And many of us will remember that uh, spectacular event for a long time to come. They came amidst the waving, the celebrating, the shouting, the dancing uh, of so many Kiwis and foreigners who had come to this uh, amazing uh, event. As we come to our passage today, we see a similar scene. We see that Jesus comes to Jerusalem amidst the shouting, uh, dancing of, of so many people. At this time of the year, it was Passover, which was the celebration for Jerusalem. So many people from far and wide had come into Jerusalem. Uh, Jerusalem's population swole o almost over a million people. And that's saying something for an ancient city. But then with Jesus, he's in Bethany, and he comes through Bethphage to um, Jerusalem, as the passage told us. There there was already a crowd because Jesus at this time was at the heart of his population, popularity. He had exercised an, an amazing ministry that had grown in momentum over those three years. And do remember that it was just at this time he had raised Lazarus from the grave. So he was someone you wanted to see. He was someone you wanted to hear. The crowds were around him. So there was this vast crowd in Jerusalem and this vast crowd with Jesus. And as he makes his way from Bethany through Bethphage to Jerusalem, the two vast crowds come together having come from Africa, at the bottom of Africa, two great oceans come crashing together at the tip of Africa. And that's what happened with this crowd. They came bowling into one another, this vast milieu of people as uh, Jesus chose to enter uh, Jerusalem. So out of keeping with his normal practice. So strange for Jesus to do this at this time. Because if you trace the rest of his ministry, you'll see it was in seclusion. You'll see that again and again and again, as soon as the crowds built up, Jesus was out of there. Remember with the feeding of the 5,000, that was 5,000 men, about fifteen to 20,000 people. They wanted to grab him and, and raise him up as their king. But he dismisses them and the disciples and withdraws yet again to a quiet, lonely place. That was his normal practice not to have the eye of the public. But on this occasion, everything changes. He comes in in spectacular way for the crowd. And it's interesting that this event is rep recorded for us in all four Gospels. Very seldom do you see an event in all four of the Gospels, but each one of them uh, record this event, each one from a different angle, and thankfully they do that because they each one shed a new uh, shaft of light on the story that when we put it all together, we, we get a, a holistic picture. In fact, this event is so important that if you read John's Gospel, you'll see that he starts to write it in John chapter 11. And you know that there's 21 chapters in John. That means 50%. 50% of John's Gospel is Holy Week. 
half of the entire gospel is this final week. The other gospel writers, about a third of their entire gospel deals with this week that we're going to be deal dealing with, Holy Week, from the entry of Jesus to the crucifixion and glorious resurrection and ascension. What we're going to do this morning, as the passage was read to us in Mark's gospel, we're going to camp there, but I'm going to draw some threads from the other gospels as well to give us this morning as full a picture as possible of this great triumphant event, uh, the entry of Jesus uh, into Jerusalem. The first thing I want to point out to you is the comprehensive control of Jesus. The comprehensive control of Jesus uh, at this time. You see, some people even today say what was actually happening. Jesus was swept up. Jesus was caught up with this great event, and he didn't really want to come to Jerusalem. After all, he was on the most wanted list. After all, they were already baying for his blood. He didn't really want to come, but the crowd caught him up, and he was carried along with emotion, and he found himself in a city where he didn't want to be because of the, the dominance of the crowd. Far, far from it. Jesus was absolutely in control of the events which were transpiring. Now, your Bible should be open. Look there in Mark's Gospel. It's page 981. We read these words. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you and just as you enter it, you'll find a colt tied there which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Tell them, the Lord. The Lord needs it. And uh, we, he'll send it back shortly. This doesn't smack to me of someone who's caught up in the euphoria of an event where he's not in control. This was all planned by Jesus. In fact, if you read earlier in the Gospels, it says, and I'm quoting old King James, which is in my blood, he set his face like a flint towards Jerusalem. Nothing and no one would stop him going there. Even his disciples said, we can't go there, they'll put us to death. But Jesus' heart was to go to Jerusalem at this time. And now the Bible gives us details. I love the Bible's details. It's not just make-believe. This really happened. You see, he makes mention of the towns through which Jesus passed. He was at Bethany, that's where Mary and Martha was and where now Lazarus was that he had raised from the dead. They were his friends. He often went to their home. They pass from Bethany through Bethphage to Jerusalem. It's like going from Remuera to Ponsonby into the city. Sort of a little bit of a, a circular route. And, and he had to do that because for those who have come with me to the Holy Land, you'll know that on the one side of the city of Jerusalem, there's the, the Mount of Olives, which is a pretty high hill. And you've got to go over the top of the Mount of Olives by way of Bethphage, down the valley, over the Kidron Brook, the little brook which would have soon be running red with blood from the lambs that were sacrificed, and then up the hill to the city of Jerusalem. So he curves around from Bethany, Bethphage, over the hill, the Mount of Olives, down he goes, over the Kidron, and in amongst the people. And what he's doing, what he's doing is declaring himself to be the king. And he's doing it in a very subtle way. Now, for us, unfortunately, it's a bit lost because we don't understand the culture. So let me give you a few puzzle pieces to put into place. You, you will note that he says to the disciples, go and get the cult. And if someone asks you why you're doing this, say the Lord needs it. That word is the sovereign needs it. He's declaring himself to be the sovereign. What's more, when a sovereign came into a city, it was the culture that that sovereign could commandeer any animal he wanted for his transport. So you see, Jesus is behaving as a sovereign. The sovereign needs it. He commandeers the transport. What's more, he takes the colt of a donkey. It's interesting. He doesn't take the mother of the donkey. He takes the colt. You see, the rule was that if the king rode an animal, that animal couldn't be ridden by anybody else. So he takes an unridden animal, 
to ride in. Now, I did my military training in South Africa like all the other young men in South Africa had to do, and I was seconded for various reasons to the horse unit, and part of my job was to break in wild horses to be used on the border of South Africa. And I want to tell you, <laughs> to break in a horse is a huge undertaking. To come near an unridden or an unbroken horse, you take your life on, at, at, at risk. For Jesus to have sat on an unridden donkey shows his kingly rule over nature. And so he sits on this donkey, and he comes in amongst the praises of the people, again, just as a king would do. And note this, they throw their garments at his feet. Again, the symbol of rulership and kingship. You see, it goes back uh, in the Old Testament to where, when this happened, and I'll mention to you um, a little bit later um, uh, where that particular event happened. This is the triumphant king commandeering the transport, unridden. He comes amidst the shouts of his people, presenting himself. Please note, it's not against his will. It's not on the one hand that he's being taken by the crowd against his will, and it's not as though he's dragging his heels in the dust and he doesn't want to go because he knows what lays ahead. This was voluntary, this was loving, this was presenting himself to the nation. And I love this part. I hope you get excited about it because I'm so excited to share this with you. This fulfills prophecy. This fulfilled, you see, my friends, uh, I don't want to give away tonight, but we're going to look at some amazing prophecies to see how accurate the Bible is. Christianity is the only religion that has prophecy. No other religion has prophecies quoted hundreds of years before the event that are fulfilled minutely. I want to just touch on two. Number one, Genesis chapter 20, uh, 49 says this. Now, now, this is written from Genesis, the first book in the Old Testament, and just Stay with me. When we speak of a prophecy, often it's in germ form. It's, it's a shadow. It's a suggestion that will, over the years, come to fruition. So see here the germ. See here the shadow. See here the innuendos, which are beautifully developed later. Genesis 49 from verse 10, it says this. Speaking of this coming king, the scepter will not depart from Judah. Jesus is the ruler, the king of kings, the lion of the tribe of Judah, that's what the Bible calls him. The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until him to whom it belongs shall come, and the obedience of the nation shall be his. So here comes the ruler from the tribe of Judah to the people, and they celebrate as a nation before him. And then note this, verse 11. He will tether his donkey to the vine, the colt to his choice vine. <laughs> That's just amazing. All those elements, the idea that there's the scepter, he's from Judah, he's the ruler, the people are shouting his praises, there's a donkey that's tethered to the vine, is he not the vine? in John 15. Can you see how Scripture is just giving us these Old Testament prophecy, which is beautifully fulfilled on that day? But if that's not enough for you, let's go almost to the end of the, New, the Old Testament, and we go to Zechariah uh, chapter 9 and verse 9. Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. What was happening? He had come to Jerusalem, daughter of Zion, Zion is another name for Jerusalem, amidst the shouts of his people, see your king, <laughs> see your king comes to you, Righteous, note, not see your king is being brought to you, but he comes to you, this is the voluntary action of Christ, righteous and victorious, there's no defeat here, you say a donkey victorious, I say yes, because kings rode donkeys in that time, one day, Revelation 19, he will ride the white horse and come victorious king of kings and lord of lords and cast Satan out and introduce the new heaven and the new earth. One day he will come victoriously. On that day he came as a on a donkey. Righteous, 
victorious, lowly, and riding on the donkey, on the colt of a donkey, the foal of a donkey. That was written hundreds of years before Jesus came. Now, I know what some skeptics say. I know what some skeptics say. They say he orchestrated it. He set up this event. You tell me how one lowly carpenter who hardly had a change of clothes and didn't have a place to lay his head at night, had to borrow transport, a lowly carpenter can get together two million people to shout his praises right under the nose of the Romans. They knew they were taking their lives in their hands by having the celebration. You can't tell me that one lowly carpenter will ever orchestrate such a thing. This was the work of God. He knew exactly what he was doing. He was in control. Go into the town. There you'll see a donkey, the colt of a donkey. Untie it. Bring it to me. If they ask the question, this is what you say. This is how they'll respond. I will use the donkey and I'll return it. That speaks to me of someone absolutely sovereignly in control. You see, he always behaved like that. Remember early in John's Gospel when he met that young man by the name of Nathaniel. And Nathaniel asked him questions and he said, Nathaniel, Nathaniel, I saw you while you were under the fig tree on the other side of the hill. On another occasion, remember Judas? He knew that Judas was going to betray him. And remember when Peter needed taxes? Peter, go, throw your line at that place. There will be a fish. Catch the fish in its mouth. There will be enough taxes for you and for me. <laughs> Can you see his sovereign control? Remember when just the next chapter, when he's got to go to the upper room, what does he say? Oh, disciples, go into town, and as you are going into town, you'll see a man carrying a pot of water. Follow him. When he gets to his home, tell the master of that town, I'm coming to your, t to your house. I'm going to use the upper room which you have, which will be big enough for me and my disciples to have the last supper. He knew it all. He's absolutely in control. So, my dear friends, surely the application is this, that you and I can take confidence that Jesus has not lost control. For I read in my Bible, he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If he controlled all things then, he controls all things now, and I can trust him. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. I wonder if God brought you here today to hear that. You're fretting. You're uncertain. You're anxious about the future. You don't know which way to turn. Where do you get the advice? I want to say on the authority of the word of God, that Jesus who controlled everything that day will control it for you if you bear to trust him and lay it at his hands. There's a second thing I want to point out to you from our passage. I'm telling myself to slow down. <laughs> Unfortunately, I get too excited and the words don't come. This is precious stuff. This is, this is stuff that can't slide over us. The second thing, look at the response of the crowd from verse 7 of our passage. Reading from verse 7, it says, When they brought the cult to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while the others spread branches they had cut from the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed behind shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Blessed, Hosanna in the highest Note the response of the crowd. They, they showed Hosanna. They're really excited. You say, this is it. Surely they understand. No, they don't. No, they don't. You see, they got it all wrong that day. They had another agenda. When they shouted Hosanna, which is save now or liberate now, they were thinking of a political liberator. They were th thinking of someone who would be a military leader who would set them free from the crushing heel of Rome. They thought, this is our deliverer. Now we can have a massive uprising. We can overthrow Rome, and we can take control of our city again. They see in him the political revolutionary. They have the wrong agenda. 
It's interesting, um, I alluded to this earlier, in 2 Kings chapter 9, there's an incident in the Old Testament where a new king was inaugurated. We've just recently been looking at Elijah. Remember those studies on Elijah? And remember how I underscored that um, the king at the time of Elijah was Ahab and his wicked wife Jezebel. Well, they had run the country into the ground. They had run it far away from God. And the people were, were sick and tired of what was happening. And so God, in his great mercy and kindness, as he always does, raises up a new leader, uh, Jehu. And uh, the prophet of God sends someone to go and anoint Jehu as king. And Jehu's friends see that he's been anointed as king. And they start to shout and chant, Jehu is king, Jehu is king. And you know what they do? They throw their garments at his feet. They throw their garments at his feet, symbolizing Jehu, start the revolution, set us free from the oppression. And that's exactly what they do on this occasion with Jesus. Jesus is king, Jesus is king, set us free. The agenda was wrong. Little did they know, little did they know that actually Jesus is the liberator. The liberator from someone far greater than Rome. He is the liberator from sin itself. Little did they know the greatest liberator of all time had stepped onto the stage of human history. For the book of Galatians says this, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Is Christ a liberator? Yes, he is. Is he a political liberator? No, he's not. And having come from Africa, we were sick to our back teeth about political, spiritual liberation and how they, they misplaced Jesus. I even saw pictures of Jesus with an AK-47 in his hand. That's to miss the boat. On this occasion, Jesus came as the liberator from our sins. In fact, at the beginning of his ministry, he declares why he's come. He says in Luke 4, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoner and recovery of sight to the blind and to set the oppressed free and to proclaim the, law, the, the year of the Lord's favor, his freedom. You see, Christ did come as a liberator, not from a political agenda, but from a spiritual agenda. He set us free from our sin. The Bible says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. And then in Hebrews, it says this, since the children have flesh and blood, he too, that is Jesus, he too shared in our humanity so that by his death he may break the power of him who holds the power of death over us. That is the evil one. So he came to liberate me from sin and death. And he came to be the spiritual liberator. You see, they made a mistake that people are still making today. Their mistake is this. They wanted a Jesus on their terms. They wanted Jesus on their terms. They wanted him to be their liberator, their setter free, their overthrow of Rome. Many people today want Jesus on their terms. They want Jesus to accommodate their way of life. They want Jesus to be kind and accepting and accommodating and gracious to the way they live and their standards, and their morals. And they say to us, my Jesus would never say that. My Jesus would never do that. My Jesus would just love all people everywhere, however they be. That's my Jesus. Well, my dear friends, that's not the Jesus of the Bible. And you see, we can't invent a Jesus that suits us. If we do that, we're going back to the Israelites making our own golden calf all over again. And there are many people today who invented Jesus that suits them. And God forbid we would do that, or we'd do that in this church. The only Jesus we can take is the Jesus of Scripture. The Lamb, the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Let's be sure we haven't made a gold calf for ourselves. We haven't propped up a Jesus in our imagination that just suits our lifestyle. We need to have the Jesus of the Bible. Well, one last thing, our time is up. 
the deep sorrow of Jesus, the deep sorrow. It's not mentioned in this passage. You'll see there in verse 11 of chapter 11, it says, Jesus entered Jerusalem and went to the temple. Just, just pause there. Don't make the mistake of thinking that Jesus came to Jerusalem. Jesus came to the temple. There's a big difference. You see, he didn't come to be owned by the crowd. He came to be the Lamb of God to sacrifice himself. At this time, thousands of people were bringing their lambs to the temple to be analyzed, to be accepted for worship. Jesus went to the temple, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. He didn't come for the fame of Jerusalem. He came for the sacrifice of Calvary. It's interesting, Luke's gospel tells us something. Luke chapter 19 says this, As he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from you. The days will come upon Jerusalem when your enemies will build a rampart against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side, and they will dash you to the ground, Jerusalem, you and your children within your walls. They will not leave one stone upon another. That's just what happened. In AD 70, Vespasian encircled Jerusalem. His soldiers came in. They killed thousands of Jews, and they destroyed the temple, and they didn't leave one stone on another. And those of you who came with me to the Holy Land, I can well remember, we stood there and looked at this pile of massive stones, all piled up, not one stone left on another. You see, the temple was lined with gold. And when they burnt it, the gold ran into the crevices of the rocks. So the soldiers pushed the rocks apart to get to the seams of gold to fulfill the prophecy of Jesus, not one stone left on another. But what I want to pick up is that Jesus wept. Jesus wept because they were hard-hearted. Jesus wept because they would choose their religion over him. Jesus wept because they would turn their back on him. Note what it says in Isaiah 53. Again, a, a, an amazing prophecy. Isaiah 53 from verse 2. He grew up amongst them like a tender shoot, like a root from dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that would cause us to desire him. He was despised and rejected a man of sorrows familiar with suffering, like one from whom we hide our faces. Surely he took our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken for us. But he was pierced for our transgression. He was crushed for our iniquity. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. He wept. He wept because they were hard-hearted and they chose their worship style of sacrifice giving over Christ. And maybe I can close with that question. Are we making Jesus weep? Do we make him weak because we are hard-hearted? Do we make him weep because we choose to go our own way? We choose another way of salvation. We choose another route. Do we cause him to weep because of our disobedience? Lord Jesus, do I cause you to weep? Do I disappoint you? He wept on that day. The crowd turned against him, and he wept. I think he weeps today for New Zealand. So many, so many have forsaken him. In fact, it says that in the last times that will happen. Matthew 24 at that time, many will turn away and the faith and betray one another. And then in 1 Timothy, it says, the Spirit clearly says in the last times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceptive spirits taught by demons. That's happening in our country. Our country is maybe the most secular country in the world. Our country is probably the country that has moved furthest from Christendom than any other country on the earth. Many will turn. Oh, for, for Christ's sake, that we would not turn, that we would not break his heart, that we would not cause him to weep. What have we seen today? Number one, the comprehensive control of our Savior. Number two, the crowd's response to him because of their agenda. 
the wrong agenda. And number three, we've seen the compassionate concern of Jesus to weep over the temple. And we ask ourselves the question, do I cause him to weep? This Easter, let us be those people who glad in the heart of Christ by flying the flag for him, unashamed of our Jesus, this Easter making our stand perhaps as never before. Dear Lord, thank you for this amazing passage which has gladdened our heart today. Thank you that we can be comforted from the fact that you are in control of all things. Lord, we pray that you deliver us from making a golden calf, for making a Jesus to suit our lifestyle instead of receiving the Jesus of the Bible. And, O Lord, we pray that in no means we would cause you to weep, but we would gladden your heart by our unstinted, unpolluted commitment to Christ in a day where so many are leaving you. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.